Greetings, boys and babes. So glad you're joining us for another episode of The Magic Hour. I'm Mercedes Terrell, and with me, as always, my majestic partner in shine, Jade Bryce. Hey, Jade. Hey, you guys. Today, we're having on Cornell Thomas. Cornell has written a couple of books all focused on being positive, even in the midst of extreme adversity. His first title is The Power of Positivity, Controlling Where the Ball Bounces, followed by The Power of Me, Army of One. And his latest book is called Extraordinary, The Distance Between Good and Great. Cornell travels all over the world sharing his story, and his third book was endorsed by Tony Robbins. He currently does an event called the Positivity Summit that looks pretty interesting, but I'm sure he'll fill us in on all that. Yes. And who doesn't want more positivity in their lives? We could all use a little bit of that. So Mm -hmm. without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author and expert in positive self-awareness. He has been endorsed, like Jade said, by some of the top experts in his field, including Tony Robbins and Dr. Cornell West. Growing up with adversity his whole life allowed him to get past the why me's and focused on, on the what now's. Seven Mm -hmm. days away from playing professional basketball in Europe, he suffered a career-ending injury that derailed his dream. And through this, he has become the perfect example of turning a loss into a win. Mr. Cornell Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! Want to do that one more time? Yeah. See if we can get through that one more time. Call recorder warning. This Mac is not running fast enough to record the video from this call. The recording frame will be lowered to compensate. Yeah, I know. You always fucking do that to me. (laughs) Okay. Let me see if I can fix these settings. Oh, video frame rate. That's new. Okay. Let's do this again. Greetings, boys and babes. So glad you're joining us for another episode of The Magic Hour with me, Mercedes Terrell, and with me... Nope, try that again. Greetings, boys and babes. So glad you're joining us for another episode of The Magic Hour. I'm Mercedes Terrell, and with me, as always, my majestic partner in shine, Jade Bryce. Sorry, they're going to say hi, Jade. (laughs) Sorry, I can't. I will. You want me to do it again? Well, I'll just start. He can cut this part out. Sorry, Adam. Hey, you guys. Today, we're having on Cornell Thomas. Cornell has written a couple of books, all focused on being positive, even in the midst of extreme adversity. His first title is The Power of Positivity, Controlling Where the Ball Bounces, followed by The Power of Me, Army of One. And his latest book is called Extraordinary, The Distance Between Good and Great. Cornell travels all over the world sharing his story, and his third book was endorsed by Tony Robbins. He currently does an event called the Positivity Summit that looks pretty interesting, but I'm sure he'll fill us in on all of that. Yeah, that looks super interesting, and who doesn't want more positivity in their lives? I know we could all use a little bit of that. So, without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author and expert in positive self-awareness. He has been endorsed by some of the top experts in his field, including, like Jade was mentioning, Tony Robbins and by Dr. Cornell West. Growing up with adversity his whole life allowed him to get past the why me's and focus on the what now's instead. Seven days away from playing professional basketball in Europe, he suffered a career-ending injury that derailed his dream. Through all this, He has become the perfect example of turning a loss into a huge win. Mr. Cornell Thomas. That was really good. I like that one a lot. Cool. Um, Okay, cool. You want to act like you just got off? Yeah. All right. Page right down. Yay, that was so good. I know. The world needs more people that have his mindset. Yes, more Cornells in the world, please. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to use a lot of all that inspiration, all that inspo for this, this new year we're in. Yeah. <laughs> all right, girl, what's, what's your magic trick today? Give it to me. Lay it on me. So um, my magic trick today is 
just saying thank you. This may sound super silly, but me and my kids say um, when we get home, before turning off the car, we say, thank you, car, for bringing us home or taking us to the park. And then when we get home, we say, hi, home, thank you. Thanks for keeping us safe. And, you know, I've talked about in the past how we touch the earth and thank the earth. Um, and as silly as the sound, it just helps us to stay in a state of gratitude. It helps us to be positive about what we have, even though we, you know, would like to be in a more spacious car or in a home of our own instead of an apartment. We focus on being positive about what we do have. And I believe that what you focus on expands. And also that if you're not grateful for what you do have, then the universe doesn't bring you more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more grateful you become, the more you realize how much you really do have to be grateful for. Saying thank you is just a great habit to form and it shifts your focus. So, you know, as woo woo as this might sound, I find it to be really beneficial in my life. I love that you just use the term woo-woo first off, mm -hmm. but um, also, <laughs> also, yes, you, I actually like see, you know, I know if any of you follow Jade, if you don't, you should, but she'll post stuff like this where her kids are thanking the earth, you know, for being under their feet and thanking the car for bringing them home safely or whatever it is. And as silly, like you said, Jade, as silly as that might sound, if you can put aside the silly part of it or the things that really like trigger our weird little egos that say we're not supposed to do those things, that's not the norm. Mm -hmm. The practice of just like what the feelings are that are being brought up in you every time you do that are so important to make sure we're integrating into our lives on the daily. So I think you're setting a super good example for those them chillants and also <laughs> just Thanks. for the world in general. Thank you for that magic. Thanks. What about you? So my magic trick is to I actually got this from Cornell, our guest today. Oh. Yeah. Um, to find ways, little ways to pay it forward. And one of the ways that he's mentioned mm. um, they do in their Positivity Summit, I believe, is just going to like a Starbucks or go wherever you get coffee at or somewhere. Maybe it's like a, a fast food restaurant or something that you're going to go to anyway. And just paying for the person behind you. Or if you're feeling really you know, wealthy that day or really grateful that day, then pay for several people behind you, whatever it is that you can, yeah. you know, put towards, or even just it's like, Hey, put $5 on the person's, uh, you know, whatever they're buying, whoever the person is mm -hmm. behind me doesn't need to be anyone you've ever known. You don't need to even let them know that you're doing it. It's probably better that you don't. And just spreading that kind of hope that, um, Cornell talks about and allowing people to see hope, out there in humanity, you know, like hope in humanity. I think we're really lacking that in this day and age. And I think a little gesture like that, paying it forward, um, can change the world little by little. It'd be the change, man. Yeah. That's all it is. I love that. That's so super cool. I'm going to do another one too, just in case he says that, because he might say that about his positivity summit. I don't want to like double up on it. Mm, okay. But my other one does not apply at all. It's a mosquito one, but it's still, I think it's one that we recorded originally, but I yeah, we did, but we mm -hmm. didn't use that episode, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. I wanted to make sure we didn't use it. I was going to ask you. Okay. Um, so my magic trick is super random, not related to anything in this episode, but sometimes I got to throw out something that became useful in my life or is about to be useful in my life in this case. So I asked the internet, I asked the Instagram really what I could do to stop getting bit my, bit my mosquitoes, bit <laughs> by mosquitoes. I don't know why I can't talk today, but if you guys have maybe the same blood type as me, or I don't know what it is, the lotion I'm wearing, something, and are getting eaten by mosquitoes every time you're out in the world in a mosquito-ridden place, mm -hmm. I know Texas. you feel my pain. Yeah, I know you feel my pain, and especially when this mosquito season is upon you. Anyway... Mm -hmm. So what I got back from Instagram and the internet combined, no idea, you know, how deep the science goes on this or um, how it's going to work because I haven't had a chance to apply it to my life yet. However, I did do some, <clears throat> excuse me, I did do some research and there was lots of people saying that this is the best um, method. So what you can do to deter mosquitoes is use um, vitamin B1, also, n also known as thiamine. And mm. I guess when you take this in higher doses, 
It can help you reduce how attracted mosquitoes are to you. And apparently it's exerted by your skin and it masks the natural human odors um, that insects are attracted to. So I'm going to give that a try. I'll let you guys know the results of that. But in the meantime, if you're interested and you're going to somewhere with mosquitoes or you know that's going to be an issue in your life, do some research on it and look it up. Comment to us. Let us know how it worked for you because we want to know. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to try to find a kid's form for that because my kids really, really get eaten up just like walking to the car and then they turn into little knots, the bites, and it's just they can't stop scratching. So thank you for that. I'm going to use it. I'm sorry I made mm-hmm. you itchy because I heard you scratching while you were just saying that. <laughs> I yeah, I did. It. That's funny. <laughs> Luckily, it's winter, so I know that. That's just dry itch. It's a dry yeah. itch. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you guys, thanks for listening. We hope you found this conversation with Cornell just super uplifting and that it was a light in your day. If so, please share it with your friends and family. That would mean so much to us. And remember, you can always go to our Instagram page at The Magic Hour to ask us or any of our future guests a question. Talk to you guys next week. Until then, be a light. Thank you to Cornell Thomas for being on our show today and to Summer and Drayson for my mosquito magic trick. She's the one who <laughs> passed that along to me. And to at Raytone Royal for our intro jam. And of course, to our boy Adam from Red Fox Audio for producing the show. Adam, I'm going to do one more of those exits without Summer and Drayson in it because if I don't use that, if we don't use that magic trick, then you'll have to use oh, yeah. the yeah, yeah. in it. Okay, cool. Thank you to Cornell Thomas for being on our show today and to at Raytone Royal for our amazing intro jam. We are still very much enjoying. And of course, to our boy Adam from Red Fox Audio for producing the show. You know we love you. Yeah. Stay magical, friends. Okay. Um, let me. What kind of time are we looking Cornell at? Cornell Thomas. Well, he said he was ready, so I'm going to oh, go ahead and ready. call him. I mean, he messaged me like 30 minutes ago said, I can't wait. So, oh, my God. He is on it. Um, he's like sitting at his computer like. I know. I feel so bad. <laughs> Why? I mean, just, I, I just, like, I just said everyone was like this. Oh. Um, but just because, you know, he was the one that we like. Uh, why am I not seeing you anymore? Where'd you go? I'm here. I don't know. I could see you. Can you hear hmm. me? I can hear you. Hmm. Did you already try to add him? No. Hmm. Well, I was about to, but then you went away. Oh, I don't know. I'm still gone? Yeah. (sighs) It's so dry here. My voice, as you can tell, is like drying out every other word. The wind has been insane. I've never had wind like this. It's like freezing cold wind like in Vegas. Hmm. Can you try clicking your video just in case? Sure. But I can see you and you're moving and everything, you know? I know, but I can't see you. Okay, I clicked it and it turned it off. I'm going to click it to turn it back on. Okay, I'm back on. There you are. Awesome. That's weird. Now I'm going to add him. Oh, there he is. (laughs) I just entered CO. Again, why can't all guests be this way? Oh, my God. (laughs) All right, let me put the metal on. I'm back, right? That was weird. I saw that flash, too. Hey. Hi. What's going on, ladies? Big one. Cornell, hold on. Where is your face? Push the video. Oh, there, there you are. <laughs> there you there are. Is. What's going on? What's up? How are you? Do I sound okay or do I sound crazy? You sound great. Awesome. There's How's the mic? that mic? Yeah, is it working well? You're the first so person dope. we're doing this with. I'm so grateful. Mike. You guys are the shit. I oh, appreciate thanks. It. I appreciate Thank it. You. I was like, did they just send me a microphone? <laughs> I was like... This is a microphone. I was like, okay, cool. All right. This is how they do it. My bad. We can't do it any other way. We've tried, trust me, but this is the best way, apparently. And Adam's but, Adam's a good Adam's a good dude. He was yeah, like, here, he really um, person that doesn't understand technology, let me help you through this. Oh, so, he's the best. Yeah. yeah. He's great, man. So a big shout out to Adam too. <laughs> well, we appreciate you, you too. Because you've been so easy to work with. You can't even imagine some of the guests that yeah. we have on our Oh, I'm um, like, low maintenance. You've been amazing. Are you already <laughs> recording? Yeah. 
Oh, you oh, are? Perfect. Okay. I was hoping that Adam heard everything you said. So. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm super low maintenance. Mama raised me right, so yeah. I'm not okay. crazy stuff. But I can only imagine what you guys have to go through. If only your mom raised all of our men. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Mama T. Uh, but I appreciate you guys having me. This is so awesome. You guys, yeah, we're, I love, we're love what you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. That's and awesome. Same to you. How did you find us, by the way? So, so you guys are friends with, um, I think his name's Jimmy Smith. He's yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. So Jimmy was following me like a while back. I, I do jiu-jitsu. I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Oh, wow. Okay. So through the jiu-jitsu circles, uh, I saw him and you guys, and I was like, the magic hour, what's that? Let me check it out. So I listened to, uh, you, ha- you guys had one of, it was all about like mental, like depression. and like uh, Yeah, Jamie Tchaikovsky. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, this is dope. So I was like, all right, cool. These are people that I definitely want to talk to. So then I reached yeah. out because if I meet people that I think are cool, I'm like, I'm reaching out. So I just yeah. reached out. Awesome. And here we are. Uh, so Mer- Mercedes, I really like the intro that you already read for him, but um, add Black Belt and Jiu Jitsu on this one. <laughs> oh, good idea. Let me just read it again. That's important. We need to know these things. Well, because most of our f- uh, listeners are MMA. Yeah. yeah so. I love that. Yeah. 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 They'll, be, they'll I... listen a little closer. Yeah. But... <laughs> now I'll listen. He's got to say. <laughs> um, my son just started jujitsu last week. Yes. So, yes. yeah, it's super cute. How, how old is your son? Three. Three? Three and, and a half. Jiu-jitsu last mm-hmm. week? Beast. Yeah. I want him to be a black belt by 16. Yeah. <laughs> where, now, yeah. where, where are you on the globe? I'm in Austin. Mercedes is in Orange County. How about you? I'm in New Jersey. Okay. But we I'm, used to was... have fights in New Jersey all the time at yeah. um, Atlantic City. Yeah, it was um fought in Bellator. Who was oh, cool. um Eddie Alvarez? Yeah, yeah. A couple of my friends have fought in Bellator before. Oh, oh nice. cool. Who? Uh, uh, Claudio Ledesma. He's a one. I think he fought in Bellator one twenty five or one thirty five. Okay. Uh, I always say he's like the size of my thigh, like one of my thighs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we call that we call that uh fairy weight. Yeah. Yeah. Fairy. yeah. <laughs> I dated one yeah. one twenty five er and. Did you beat him I, up? I I I felt. It just felt weird. Not safe. Someone being <laughs> not safe. That's terrible, you guys. He's an uh, expert in safe. combat sports. No, I but it made me be... feel like I was too big. You know. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That's interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're so tiny that that's really hard to do. So he's yeah. the well, only guy who's ever done yeah. that. I'm sure. How tiny are you? Let me guess. Let me guess. Okay, guess. Five, two. Yep. Pretty good. Really good. <laughs> really Thank you good. very much. I will now walk out. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't leave yet. No, okay. My mom. My mom <laughs> So I was just like, I figured. But my mom's tough. She'll punch you in the face twice before you can say anything. Oh, I've never oh, punched boy. anybody, but no. maybe I should. I never punched. I've don't, never punched. Don't anybody. do it. Um, okay, so Mercedes is going to read her, the intro, and then we'll jump into the questions. Great. Okay. All right. So you're going to just start with, so without further ado. Mm-hmm. So without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author who's also a black belt in jiu-jitsu, by the way, and an expert in positive... And expert. Let's try this again. So without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu and an expert in positive self-awareness. He has endorsed... Why can I not read this right now? She already nailed it right before you got on. That's why. That's why. (laughs) My brain's like, we did this already. We're done. (laughs) So without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu and an expert in positive self-awareness. What am I is this just am say, I writing this in wrong? Just is say going on? an expert in positive self-awareness instead of and in because that's is that's making you stumble, on. I think. That's what's going on. So just cross out that D. Sorry, Cornell. That's okay. <laughs> Oh, well, he going. wants to hear us talk about his yes. credentials <laughs> over and over. Keep, I, I love it. Go ahead. Go ahead. So without further ado, let me introduce a multi-book author. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, an expert in positive self-awareness. He has been endorsed by some of the top experts in his field, including uh, including Tony Robbins and Dr. Cornell West. Growing up with adversity his whole life allowed him to get past the why me's and focus on the what now's. Seven days away from playing professional basketball in Europe, he suffered a career-ending injury that derailed his dream. Through this, he has become the perfect example of turning a loss into a huge win. 
Mr. Cornell Thomas, ladies and germs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What's up, Cornell? <laughs> How are you? So, so Cornell, uh, you shed a lot of light on your story in your TED Talk. Will you share that story with our listeners? Sure. Yeah. So my story for me starts when I was about three years old. I was raised by an absolute lioness, the great Tina Thomas. My father passed away when I was three years old. Bobby mm -hmm. Thomas, police officer in the city of Passaic, New Jersey, uh, passed away from cancer. Uh, and when my dad passed away, my mom was left with the task of raising five of us on our own with no money. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of my brothers is uh, on the autism uh, spectrum. So if you have anybody in your life with autism or you know anybody with on the spectrum, it's, it's more than just raising one child. Mm -hmm. So growing up I just never dreamed of being really anything like kids want to be like you know like their father I know boys a lot want to be like their father you know they want to be superheroes whatever I didn't want to be anything I was just trying to do be as low maintenance as possible so my mom didn't have to worry about me mm. and I, I recognized that at a very, very early age I realized that even though we had the love of like 10 parents I knew that there are certain things that we didn't have financially that I just didn't want to be an extra burden on my mom. And so I'm the youngest uh, of the boys, and then we have one, I have one sister who's younger than I am. And I got to see what adversity was at a very early age. And when I go out and I speak, I say, you know, when you, you, when you experience that at three years old, when you come home as a latchkey kid and you're making your own meals, and your mom's working three jobs, it just gives you a certain grit and mental toughness. It's almost like gives you like that shield where – Everything isn't as bad. So mm -hmm. going to school and, you know, having a test or going to school or someone calling you a name or whatever. Like, I was just like, what? I got four older brothers. Like, what are you <laughs> going to give me that I can't handle? Right. And uh, seeing my mom just go through it every day and seeing bills stacked to the ceiling and her never taking it out on us, her never saying, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, being a victim of the circumstances, mm -hmm. basically, you know, and she could have easily have been that, you know, black woman, single, no money, we're in an inner city, uh, no help. And she could have used every excuse in the book to just give up. And she just never did. She doesn't have quit in her DNA. So just watching my mom really shaped who I was. And it wasn't until I was 16 years old where I actually found something that I was passionate about. Uh, my mom is from Bird's Nest, Virginia. Like Bird's Nest, Virginia is the size of this room that I'm in right now. Super, <laughs> mm -hmm. super small area. I was related to every girl in town. Like I had, everybody's my cousin. So being a 16 year old boy in a place where every girl's your cousin, it just was not cool at all. Mm -hmm. And my mom used to just take me and my brothers and my sister there. We'd stay there for a week and do nothing. Like there was nothing to do in Bird's Nest, Virginia. So one day I'm sitting on my cousin's bed, my cousin Carlos, he enlisted for the army and I look under his bed and he has all these newspaper articles. I'm like, why does he have a hundred newspapers in, under his bed? And I open a newspaper and there's a picture of my cousin dunking a basketball. Mm. Never played basketball before in my life, never cared about basketball before in my life, but something about seeing my cousin on the mm. front page of a newspaper it just resonated with me so deeply because I was lost. I was mm -hmm. lost in terms of there's nothing I wanted to do. So I was just kind of drifting through life and seeing my cousin and just reading every single article. I was like OCD. I just read every article multiple times. And then I looked on his wall and he had 50 senior pictures of the hottest girls I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I'm just like, this dude is an athlete. He's like in newspapers, like all these girls like him. I'm this cat that has like hammer pants and my mustache doesn't connect <laughs> and my brother's cutting my box and it's crooked. I'm like, <laughs> my identity is struggling. <laughs> like, I was like, I got to do something. So I'm going to play basketball. I'm going to be a professional basketball player. And so we drove back home. I found this little Pizza Hut basketball when Pizza Hut, I think, I don't know if they're still in business, but when they were, they used to like give out free basketballs. And I walked three miles to the nearest court. I said, okay, here it is. Like, I'm going to be a basketball player. I'm a six foot four black dude. This is going to be easy. So <laughs> I look at the hoop. I throw the ball up. The ball goes over the basket, rolls down the hill. Mm. So I'm like, oh, okay, let me try that again. So I did it again, same result. So I did that for about two more hours, and I realized something. Like, I suck at basketball. <laughs> like, I'm horrible. And 
I when I tell this story to people, they just they're like, there's no way. But out of the woods, like literally out of the woods, came this little five foot eight Korean guy, and he started walking towards the court. And like I would later find out that like his house was by the woods, not like some creepy dude was like, okay. <laughs> I like I have a van with no windows. What happened? Like it wasn't that story. <laughs> and he comes up to me and he goes, "My name's Ray. Do you want me to show you how to shoot a basketball?" Wow. Hmm. Like I don't it know. Sounds like a fairy god father or something. karate yeah. kid seven yeah. right yeah. and so that's a more masculine yeah. <laughs> and so he goes you want me to show you i shoot a basketball and i tell people like five foot eight korean guy six foot four black guy and i said never judge a book by its color you know we say cover but color yeah. we're so quick to stereotype you know what people can do based on what we're fed right sure. and this guy for the next two hours showed me how to properly shoot a basketball wow. and when he left i still sucked but I was a little bit less suckier than when he arrived. Mm -hmm. And he what he did for me changed the course of my life. It literally changed it changed the trajectory of my life yeah. because he gave me his time. And that's priceless. Someone it made you feel me, seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, here I am, this guy that I don't know what I want to do. This dude, the stranger comes up to me, takes two hours out of his time to show me a skill that I so desperately want. And he was only in my life like three other times after that. And I was just like, wow, like, okay, he planted this seed in my head of belief that if I work at this, I can get better. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I tell people all the time, like, our minds are gardens. Whatever you plant, it's going to grow. Totally. If you plant negativity, it's going to grow. If you plant positivity, it's going to grow. Now, that's not saying your garden is going to be without weeds. Happens all the time. But he planted in my head, hey, you keep working at this, you're going to slowly get better. So I said, okay, I'm convinced. Every day I went to the court for six hours, every single day. Rain, sleet, I don't care what was the weather was. I'd walk three miles, go to the court for six hours mm. because I had my mom's work ethic. So watching my mom work three jobs, come home, feed us, and then go back out to our other job, she didn't have to tell me to work hard at things. I just mirrored what she did. Mm -hmm. So that was such a great example of, okay, if you want to get better at something, if you want to achieve something, for her it was, if I want to pay this bill, I've got to work three jobs. If you want to do this basketball thing, you better put the time in. Mm -hmm. And she didn't have to tell me that. I just heard her say it. Like I mm -hmm. heard her through her actions. Yeah. So I, I tried out my junior year in high school, tried out for the basketball team for the first time, uh, got cut, <laughs> got cut badly. And I ended up playing JV, uh, junior varsity. And I, I never played organized sports really. So I didn't know junior varsity uh, was, if you're a junior on junior varsity, you're probably not very good at the sport mm -hmm. that you want to play. And uh, my friend was like, Cornell, you know, there's two other juniors on the team, and the two other juniors were not basketball players. Like one was in the marching band, didn't care about basketball. The other guy was like the size of like he's up to my kneecap, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wow, I'm with these guys. I want to play in the NBA, mm -hmm. and I'm not playing JV as a junior. And then my senior year came, I played like a minute a game. Like they take me in, like take me back out. I just hit, got good at handing out warders. And at the end of the season, I'll never forget the coach sat us all down in a circle. And he went through everybody and said, you know, Kevin, you know, you're our best shooter. And Anthony, you're, you know, you're going to be great next year. And he went to, down to everybody. And when he got to me, he said, Cornell, you're going to be a great businessman. Mm. Didn't say anything about basketball. Nothing. And mm. it, it like crushed me. Mm -hmm. right? Like it crushed me the fact that he couldn't muster up one sentence mm. about basketball. And I love basketball more than anybody. And he couldn't even say, hey, you know, Cornell, you know, keep working, you'll get keep better. Keep trying, yeah. Keep trying. And I had this humongous chip on my shoulder. And I was all about, oh, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. And when I get better, blah, blah, blah. And uh, a lot of people ask me, well, when you were bad at basketball, did you want to quit? Which is a very valid question. Usually when we're bad at something, we stop it, right? Mm -hmm. Most people. And I said, I never let doubt stop my due. And that was like one of the most powerful things because – I know there were times that my mom doubted that we'd be able to get through. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact, but she never let it stop her action. And I think that's the mistake that we make as human beings. Like mm -hmm. when we go after things that are, you know, we're like, can we get this? Like this is a high reach goal. Mm -hmm. And we start to go for it and we're like, man, and you get that doubt. And as soon as that doubt creeps in, you say, you know what? I'm probably not going to do that. You know, I'm probably not going to get it. So then you stop and you never know if you could have, right? So so I just never did that. And I was also willing to sacrifice some of the things that I like to do mm -hmm. 
-hmm. for something that I love. And that's humongous, right? Because I like hanging out with my friends. Yeah. I like talking to girls. I liked all that stuff. But I love the idea of my mom never having to work again because I, I got a professional contract. I love that idea. Mm-hmm. So I just kept working. My mom sat me down and she said, baby boy, she goes, I can't pay for college. She's like, I can't. Just letting you, just being yeah. honest, I just can't pay for college. I said, okay, mom. I said, that's, that's fine. I'll figure it out. And she took me to this tryout at the school, and she said she, she never saw me play before. So she thought, like, maybe if she takes me to a tryout at a college, she'll give me a scholarship. Yeah, like, okay. she didn't I was horrible. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> she's like, oh, you know, I'll just take this, the next Michael Jordan to this yeah. school, and they'll see, they'll be like, okay, here's a scholarship. You know, let's name the school after him. <laughs> so she takes me, to, takes me to the trial, and for two and a half hours, I was by far the worst player there. And the coach, out of the kindness of his heart, sat me and my mom down in his office. And he essentially said, like, you can come to school here and you can even be on the team, but you'll never play. Mm-hmm. Like, ever. Like, everybody has to die before you play. <laughs> and my my limited mindset, I was like, yes, let's go. Like, I'm going to get a college jersey. Mm-hmm. And I look to my right and my mom is just, like, stone-faced. Like, no expression. Mm-hmm. I know that look. Like, it means someone's going to die. So I'm looking at my mom, I'm like, oh wow, what like what's happening to her face? And three people in the room, me and my mom, the coach, my mom <laughs> raises her hand. And the coach is just as surprised as me, and he's like, Miss Thomas? Yeah. And my mom goes, <laughs> my mom goes, Coach Gemma, like hard neck yeah. shift to the left. <laughs> you know, how many players from St. Mary College, that's where I went, she goes, have gone to the NBA. Hmm. Not have gotten their NBA, have gone to the NBA mm-hmm. where the professionals play. And the coach looked at me like, did he change into somebody else? Because, you know, this guy sucks. And looked at my mom and he goes, Miss Thomas, none. And my mom rolls her eyes and she's like, oh, like, let's go, boo boo. It's time to, you know, like, <laughs> this is good enough. Is, for is you. it the school for you? Yeah. Is it the school for you? And we, we drove home. She said nothing to me. And me and my mom were t- to this day super tight said nothing, not a word. And in that silence, I had an epiphany. In that silence, I realized that this woman, who I love so much, believes in me more than I believe in myself. Mm -hmm. And if anybody believes in you more than you believe in yourself, whatever you want to come to fruition is probably not going to happen. Like, you have to be your biggest cheerleader. You have to be your biggest fan. And you have to believe it. You know, we're society makes us think that we can't be confident. Like, we can't have swagger. Like, we can't believe in ourselves. We can't say we're going to be great, right? So I told my mom, I said, I got a plan. I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to go to a two-year college. I'm going to go to a junior college. And I'm going to get a scholarship from that junior college. And then you don't have to worry about paying for school. Mm. And she said, okay, make it happen. So I, I worked at this place called Foot Action. And in, in where I live in the East Coast, there are no foot actions. Like, that's how mm. old I am. <laughs> and I worked at a pharmacy selling cigarettes and lottery tickets. Okay. And I And I – went to a junior college and my first year I was still like, okay. And then my second year, everything took off, you know, Mm. all the accolades, like first team, all conference, all-star teams, blah, blah, blah. And everybody was shocked except for me and my mom, because Mm. everybody sees where you land. Mm -hmm. They don't see all the work you did to get to where you landed. Right. So people see what you guys do. Oh man, that's great. You have a following, blah, blah, blah. They're like, no man. Like when we started, there was one person that listened to us. Mm-hmm. Or there's no one that listened to us. Mm-hmm. You know, people used to tell me all the time, every day, how bad I was at basketball. Like, every single day. My brother's friends would be like, yo, you're, you suck at basketball, bro. You'll never get better. I had to hear that every single day. And so when I got better, everybody was like, man, I knew you'd do it. Uh-huh. Like, I knew you'd mm-hmm. make it. And I'm just like, okay. So I get a scholarship mm-hmm. playing in North Dakota. I'm in North Dakota. <laughs> I've never even, I've been on a plane twice in my life. I'm in North Dakota. Right from New Jersey. I mean, my, I didn't even know where it was. I thought yeah. it's where the monuments. My mom was like, "No, dummy, that's South Dakota." Like, <laughs> you're gonna be. So I go there for two years, play, come home, playing with all NBA guys now, guys that play overseas in this gym, uh, and it's me. Like I'm pulling up in like my 1990 Mercury Sable. I have my headphones on because my radio doesn't work, and the guys have like Bentleys and Mercedes Benz, right. so, and I'm like, I belong here. Mm-hmm. So I uh, I was on my computer and I checked my AOL again. I'm dating myself, and I got an email from my agent and it said, "Cornell, you got a contract to play professional basketball in Lisbon, wow. Portugal." And I'm just like, "Okay, this 
is this real? So I read it, reread it like a hundred times. Right. And I was like, okay, this is dope. Like I'm going to play professional basketball. So my mom gets home. I run up to my mom. I go, mom, guess what? And she goes, what? I go, I got a contract to play professional basketball. And I shit you not. My mom said, that's great, baby. What do you want for dinner? <laughs> like <laughs> no, flinch. Nothing. no flinch. Like, okay, what? Of course you got a contract. Yeah, like duh. Duh. You know, what, what else would you get? And that's so much faith that she had in me. Mm -hmm. So I was a week out from going overseas at this big going away party of three people. It was like me, my mom, and my girlfriend. And uh, that Sunday before, I was out with some friends just shooting around. And uh, I went to go to the basket, and I heard a pop. Mm. Fell on the ground. My friends came running over, tried to get back up, walk it off. I couldn't put any weight on my right foot. Uh -oh. And so I drive myself to the hospital, which isn't smart. Uh, I drag my foot up to the emergency room. I'm sitting there, and I'm not calling my mom. Because I'm thinking to myself, whatever this is, if I call my mom, it's going to make it real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, I called her, and I think we are like 45 minutes away from the hospital. My mom got there in like 10. I don't know who she killed to get there, but <laughs> she got there. And uh, we're sitting there talking to this guy, Dr. Bradish, and he goes, Cornell, I'm going to grab the back of your calf muscle. If you feel excruciating pain, mm -hmm. that means you ruptured your Achilles tendon. We have to do surgery on Thursday. I'm supposed to leave that following Sunday. Mm. So I'm sitting there, and he grabs the back of my calf. I feel the excruciating pain. And to this day, that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I have no recollection of what happened those days. The only thing I can remember is Thursday morning, they wheeled me in for surgery. Thursday afternoon, I was out. Thursday evening, my contract was voided. Mm. And Friday morning, my mom came in my room uh, kissed me on my forehead, and I watched her walk to one of those three jobs that I told her she'd never have to work again. That was the hardest day of my life to that point because I felt like such a failure. I felt like I let her down. I put everything on myself, mm -hmm. and I said, wow, like I failed this woman. And when she left, I cried for hours. Like I would just, I was so angry. And as I got older, I realized that whenever you have to go through some, you know, crazy change, like a drastic change, it patterns like when you're when you find out you have a terminal illness, yeah. right? Like there's these five stages that you go through. You know, it's a it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. And I was in that denial phase at first, and I realized looking at that hard cast that oh, this is happening. And I was so angry for that day. Like I was so and that's not me. I might, it's never been in my character to be like angry quick. I was so pissed. And I tell people that the thing that got me through that was realizing that all the things that I've been up, been through to this point was harder than this injury. Mm. All of it. I could pick any day of my childhood to be harder than this injury. Like this injury is going to get better. But like seeing your mom, you know, talk to bill collectors on the phone. Right. And then yeah. like disrespect her. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing harder than that. Nothing mm -hmm. harder than seeing your parent get disrespected and wanting to kill someone. So I call my bus, my best friend up, my friend Kevin. I said, Kevin, pick me up on Monday. We're going to go to the gym. And he sounded like I died. He's like, Cornell, how are we going to go? There? I said, just pick me up. And for the next six months, I shot from a chair. And that did nothing for me physically. It did mm -hmm. everything for me mentally because I was back in my space. Mm -hmm. It's not like I sat, you know, in my room in these four, watched, looked at these four walls and did nothing mm -hmm. and just let my mind run crazy. I was able to just go somewhere and just for that hour, just shoot and get my mind away from the fact, the reality that I have this injury and I'm not going overseas anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my mom raised this on everything happens for a reason. And that's, it's a really tricky phrase. It's tricky. Because a lot of times when you're in the shit, mm -hmm. you're like, come on, like, what's, what's, what's the reason, mm -hmm. you know, I lost my job or mm -hmm. someone died or, all, you know, all these things that you can, all these scenarios. But for me personally speaking, my life, 100% everything has happened for a reason. Uh, and so I said to myself, well, what's the reason for this? And it was August, in August, and my old college coach from my junior college, he was now the athletic director. He asked me if I wanted to coach basketball. I was only 26 years old. And I said, no. I said, like, why would I coach? I'm 26. I'm working my way back. So I put him on that chip on my shoulder, right? Like anybody that was against me, I was like, throw them on. And, and the problem, the chip. Mm -hmm. yeah, put them on the chip. Because the problem with the chip, though, is we try to prove people wrong instead of 
proving ourselves right. So if you set the bar for yourself high, it doesn't matter what you say, right? So if I'm like, this is what I want to do, and Mercedes, you're like, you know what? You probably can't do it. I can think about what you've said and, and contemplate on that and waste my life thinking about that, or I can go after what I want to go after, right? right? So um, my girlfriend at the time was like, you should, you should go out for it. You should coach. And I hung up on her. And I learned, we're on the phone. I was like, okay, I'll put her on the chip. And then my mom said, baby, she's like, you should at least go for the interview out of respect for your coach. Mm. Went on the interview two days later, I had an orange whistle around my neck and like 50 <laughs> guys calling me coach. Mm. And I said, wow. I said, like, if, if basketball is something I was supposed to play, this wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And then I have all these kids from the inner city and we're in this rural area. They don't know how to love one another. They don't know how to go to class. They don't know how to, you know, be respectful. I mean, these kids were like me. You know, I was, at least I was respectful, but I, I hated school. I was not a school guy, yeah. right? So I'm 26. Some of these guys are 23. <laughs> and I have to show these guys how to be, how to, you know, conduct themselves and be men. And as I was going through my career, I used to visualize myself coaching in, like, you know, national championship and beating Duke. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I'm yeah. going to be a coach. Like blah blah blah, and I end up transferring to this, uh, getting a coaching job at Blair Academy. They've had some NBA guys, and it's like it was a step up. And I, my son was about to be born, and I remember thinking to myself, uh, if I coach Division One basketball, high college basketball, I'll never be in his life, mm -hmm. ever. Traveling all over the place. Traveling all over the place. Like I don't control my schedule. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, a good friend of mine was uh, coaching at a school, and I said, dude, tell me what your schedule's like. He's coaching at Division One school. And he goes, in season or out of season? I said, in season. He goes, in season, I probably go to the gym around 6.30 a.m. I was like, when do you get back home? He's like, who knows? Sometimes it's 11.30 at night. Sometimes it's midnight. Sometimes it's whatever. I said, how about out of the season? Oh, I get to the gym like 8. When do you get home? I like 9 o'clock at night. Mm. So I'm thinking to myself, like, I grew up without a father. Right. How would I ever disrespect me having a son by not being in this kid's life? And I started to get this hard pull that coaching basketball was not my purpose in life. Like I was meant to do something else. And I was on Facebook one day for whatever reason. I guess I wanted to be depressed that day. I just started reading my timeline, right? Like the most depressing stuff in the world is just like read your Facebook timeline. <laughs> And it, it, like, these are your peoples, right? Like, these are your friends. And it's like, you read, and it's like, everything is, like, OMG, like, life is so bad, blah, 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 blah. Like, my cappuccino got spilled, you know, like, all this crazy stuff. And I said, man, people, like, set their day to this. Like, this is their morning coffee. They wake up, they read their timeline, and then they go out throughout their day. And obviously, you guys are the same, like, we're energy people, right? So, like, you're getting all this negative energy as soon as you wake up. So I said, okay. I had a book of positive quotes. I started taking quotes out, positive quotes, and putting it on mm -hmm. Facebook. People started to like it. Like, even the drama bomb started to like it. So I'm like, okay, cool. And one day I woke up, and I couldn't find the book. So I wrote my own quote. Mm -hmm. People still liked it. So I was like, well, screw the book. I'm just going to write my own quote every day. And then my quotes became blogs. And then after I started writing, I started blogging, I was like, well, I'm going to write a book. And my boy was like, how are you going to write a book? I was like, I'm going to ask Google. <laughs> she knows yeah. <laughs> she knows she knows how to write a book. google's definitely a girl by the way like definitely mm -hmm. way so she finishes sweet. your sentences yeah way too sweet, guy. <laughs> um so i asked google i said google how do you write a book google's like yeah player this is what you do and i write a book and i said okay now i want to travel the world and share my story but how are you gonna do that i'm gonna say yes to every single opportunity my first time i spoke was in front of seven people in a dance studio like seven, they're all eating too, which is the worst case scenario for a speaker ever. All you hear is the like yeah. smack. I'm just sitting like, my, I was like, okay, your only goal, be so impactful, they stop eating. That's mm -hmm. it. And I just started going and traveling and speaking, and I started realizing how powerful our words are. And I was blown away. Like I get stories from people that, you know, hey, I read your blog, and this impacted my life, and this helped out, and this. And I'm not saying anything new. I'm just sharing my story, yeah. right? And that's what people understand. Like all the speakers that you hear, all the – no one's saying anything that has not been said before. It's just how they say it. It's unique to them. So people like my story because I keep it real with people. I'm not 
saying that you'll never go through adversity. I hate when people look at positivity and they think positivity is smiling all the time. Positivity isn't the absence of human emotion. It's just not living in negative emotion. Mm -hmm. That means if something bad happens to me on Tuesday, two Tuesdays from now, if I'm still worrying about that thing that happened bad to me, I'm not living my life anymore. I'm just dwelling in it, right? And it's easier said than done, but you got to have to try to do your best to work through. Yeah. And that's what positivity is to me. And I think that's a real definition. It's not like a, a fake, you know, like, just smile. Your dog died. It's okay. Get another one, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. So I, I've, been able, I've been blessed with being able to travel all over the world and write books and share my story and, uh, you know, run events and just try to change the way people think. Like, I would love to be one of the change agents and there's millions of us that like helps unite the planet mm -hmm. instead of divide us. You know, the powers that be for whatever reason doesn't want to it doesn't want to see us together. Yeah. So they try to divide us and separate us through all these different uh, you know, race, religion, politics, all this crazy stuff, instead of realizing like we're all humans, you know? Yeah. And th that's the beauty of travel. Like we never traveled anywhere. We didn't have money to travel anywhere. When and I started speaking, I'm like, man, I said, I get to see what the world is like, you know, like, mm. I think to combat ignorance, travel. Mm. Like, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. It really All wakes you up. Will wake you up. Like what you go through, go to a third world country and then you tell me what your hardship is. Yeah. And I think in this day and age, too, it's so accessible and we're coming into this place mm -hmm. where it's becoming even more and more accessible. And as we get into this, you know. Uh, autonomous vehicles and things that make uh, like the internet or like social media that make us be able to connect with people across the world instantly. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to open up more and more to that unity. You know, we have to, we have no choice, which is amazing. Yeah. It's a for little sure. unfortunate that we have to wait till we have no choice, but that's kind of the <laughs> yeah. condition, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, but I, it's, I, it's awesome. Yeah. I think you put it really eloquently when you, um, talked about how the the darknesses in your life have actually been your biggest you know um places that have pushed you into mm -hmm. learning or pushed you towards your real calling you know and helped yeah. you find the light in your life or like we say on the show a lot seek the pain for positive gain you've gone mm -hmm. into those places that were painful and of course you're probably kicking and screaming not wanting to a lot of the time especially when we're younger and we don't know you know we're not consciously going towards that stuff necessarily but you came out on the other side and in order to come out on the other side you had to have that conscious thought of like your mom taught you, you know, look back and see why um, everything happens for a reason. And what yeah. is that reason? You know, if you can, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure the words you said exactly, but it brought to mind that if we can find ways to stop externalizing all the things that we're, we consider happening to us um, and make it essentially integrate it so that it's happening for us, it, your perspective can only be positive. Yeah, one hundred percent. Can 100%. only be positive after that perspective yeah. change. So Malcolm Gladwell has a book called "The Advantages of Disadvantages." Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the big chapters, and he he did like a study. You know, he does crazy studies. Like, why is there so many uh, mustards and only one ketchup? You know, like he yeah. like mine is really fascinating. <laughs> but he was talking about the advantages of disadvantages, and he was saying when you go through especially at a young age, when you go through like a big, like this, what you, people call disadvantage, there's an advantage to it. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you're saying. Cause you look at the world a little bit different. And for me, I have so much gratitude for everything mm -hmm. coming from nothing, right. right? Like coming from like, not a lot in terms of, you know, finance, you know, lots of love, but like from finance, yeah. man, I'm, I appreciate everything. Which is interesting because some people who had come from a childhood similar would be angry at the world mm -hmm. and bitter and even become maybe even like um, a, a kleptomaniac because they feel like the, mm. the world owes them, you know? Um, so I've seen, I've seen both, um, both effects on people. It's really interesting what, um, even in siblings, how one can go one path and the other oh, can go yeah. another. So. That yeah. is interesting. Yeah. That's weird, right? Like when the same house. Yeah. And like one is like, it's like Cain and Abel. It's you know, so like interesting. One is like on the right side, everything's going great. And the other one is a like completely different path. But they were both either, you know, 
provided for the same or mm -hmm. they were both beaten just the same, you know, yeah. and yeah, oh. it's really I think interesting. Sometimes it, Cause my sister and I are super different. Like if you, mm -hmm. me too, we're super similar in, in some ways. And I think people outside of us see that more often than not, but when it's her and I, like I know we both think we have a lot of differences and I think mm -hmm. there's something in there um, when it comes to siblings about wanting to stand apart, like wanting yeah. to have, your own shine and make it different than your siblings because you're always and especially I'm the oldest so I'm always was like stop copying me you know so <laughs> there's something in that yeah um yeah. but Cornell I wanted to tell you that something that really touched me in um one of your speeches was when you basically said that we are the lottery um, I believe that's how you termed it because we have a, what, one in 400 trillion chance at being born. So yeah. we innately have purpose. We already have purpose or literally born, um, by winning the lotto essentially. Yeah. So what is your biggest tool or practice to keep that feeling alive when all things seem to be working against you? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and second, it's. I always tell people I'm not immune from storms. I'm not. I'm a human being. Things happen to me. It's me off. I'm not going to be like, oh, thank you, sir. Like, I'm a human being, right? Yeah. The one thing that I concentrate on the most when I'm going through the absolute craziest storm is, Cornell, no matter what you're going through today, you have to understand you have your life and you have your breath. And if you have your breath, you can change your situation. Mm. And that's the most fundamental thing that you can get. Like some people don't have a house, right? I have a house. Some people don't have a car. I have a car. Some people don't have a phone or a computer. But if you don't have that and you have your breath, if you have your breath, that means you have the opportunity to change your situation. Mm. Now, if you have no breath, there is no opportunity. And when people like try to combat that and argue that, I'm like the breath that you're using to argue that. Mm hmm is the breath you could be using to make something happen. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, think, that's, I, I can't remember who cool. said this, but it brings it to mind, um, and I might be misquoting who it is, but I want to say Mel Brown says, stop living like a dead person. You know, yeah. you have breath <laughs> yeah. in your lungs so you can make a change. Just do it. Yeah. I mean, I love it, that. It's, it's, and it's not an easy thing. And that's what I want to tell people. Make no mistakes. Working on your mind, getting your mind stronger is like working on any other muscle. It's going to take time, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people have atrophy of the mind. They never work on making it stronger. Mm -hmm. So you can't just expect them one day to just snap. Oh, I get it, right? I'm going to change everything. No, it takes a while, but I work on this every single day. And because life throws so much stuff at us every single day, I have plenty of practice. So I just look at it like, man, you know, you got breath, corner, you can change your situation. And I always tell myself, okay, what now? It's happened already. Any adversity that happens in your life, it's already in the past once it happens. The act has happened. Get a flat tire. It's already happened, right? Mm, Someone that's breaks a good way to think. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, now what are you going to do about it? It's either right. why me or what now? Mm -hmm. So I'm just right. a complete what now person. Yeah. I love that. And also, um, I loved what Mercedes brought up. And another thing that had really stuck out to me in your TED Talk was um, – how when you talk about your mother, um, you you say that people's purpose doesn't have to be grandiose. You, um, you know, her whole purpose was to keep a roof over your head and, and food on your table. So do you have any tips maybe for people who um, need to pull the reins in on their expectations of themselves to focus on their smaller but more immediate needs in their lives so that they can be the best person, you know, to maybe meet those bigger goals. You know, a lot of people are focused on being everybody's hero, um, but then their immediate goals in their homes aren't being met. Mm. Yeah. I would say be honest with yourself. That's the first thing, right? I used to have, when I was coaching bas basketball, I'd have players come into my office and say, Hey coach, I want to play at, you know, Villanova university. I want to play at, And I'm like, you're five foot two and you have a 1.6 GPA and you're never in the gym. Mm-hmm. 
So why don't we sit back and figure something out? Because the first thing you have to do is take care of your grades. And the second thing you have to do is actually work on basketball. And the mm. third thing you have to do is work on your aim because your aim is way too high, mm. way too high because you're not there and you're not going to be there. So mm. I think just having that honest conversation with yourself. Like I always – I do my best not to put ceilings on people, but that's it's a difference depending on who the person is. Like if I know that you're a worker, like if I know that if I mm. give you information, you're going to go crazy and work on it. That's different. But if I know you're a dog, like you ain't doing nothing and you're lazy <laughs> and you're trying to tell me I'm going to be a millionaire next month. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, you ain't going to be no millionaire next mm -hmm. month. You know, and when I was saying about my mom, like sometimes your purpose is raising, you know, just raising your kids or doing. There's nothing wrong with that. Like there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a smaller purpose. Like not everybody is going to change, you know, try to change the planet. You know, and is like, it even smaller? Like, is that the right word for it? You know, yeah. because we're just this pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan would have put it, right? We're yeah. <laughs> I'm also as a whole. So I just feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the, yeah There's no it's small purpose, small. right? No. Yeah, yeah, that's no. the whole point. I think Every, yeah. everybody is part of this uh, moving, evolving situation called humanity. So for sure, I and we're all. I mean, you need people. Like same thing with entrepreneurship. Like I just wrote a book on entrepreneurship. You need people, you need worker bees, you need mm -hmm. like, everybody plays a part in this, Every, all of us, everybody's important in this, right, for this, for this whole, for this rock to, that we spin on mm -hmm. to keep going, we all play our part, and if you take pieces out of it, then it's no longer whole, right, so, yeah, I think that it's just being, having a real conversation, and then having people around you that will check you, I have, my friends will check me, like, if I say, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do this and I'm not working for it. They're like, nah, you, you ain't getting that. <laughs> I have like real friends. That helps too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm also curious, um, when it comes to your mom, you said that she doesn't take she never took her stress out on you. Mm -hmm. What would be your number one advice to parents who do struggle with taking their stress out on their kids? You've got to separate your stress from your from your kids like you have to separate it, right? So my mom would have a really hard day at work and I know we weren't good all the time like we were like knuckleheads, right? Mm -hmm. But <laughs> my mom would do this thing where she just breathe like she'd take a <laughs> like a deep breath mm -hmm. And she would just and I know that like now I can rationalize like what she was doing like she was just taking kind of like setting herself and understanding okay, they had nothing to do with my job at the ICU mm -hmm. unit, like they had nothing to do with it. They're just being kids right now. And it's mm -hmm. hard for like for me. So I have a five year old and a three year old, right? You have a long day at work or you're working really hard or, you, you know, I just fly in from traveling and you come home and like something crazy happens. And it's very easy to add on. You have to stop it. Like I always tell people like, you know, positivity and negativity, they work the same way in terms of they both need momentum, right? Like they need momentum to get bigger. So if you have, if I'm working and I'm, say I have a speech or whatever, and I'm traveling back home and the flight gets delayed and then whatever, you know, whatever happens when I get home and then I get home and open the door and my kids get in trouble or they break something or whatever. If I add on to that snowball, now it's, av now it's an avalanche. But if I can separate it and say, look, work, kids, mm -hmm. right? They don't flow together like that. Uh, you know, I can handle a little bit better. So when my mom would get home, I could just see it in her eyes sometimes where <laughs> she would just need a second. She would just be like, mm -hmm. you know, or she'd go to her room and come back out. And it was like a new Tina Thomas. <laughs> she'd go to her room and just come back out and like, okay, what do you guys want to eat? And it would be like a new Tina Thomas. So I think mm -hmm. just give yourself wonder a what she did in there. I'll yeah. probably punch she, the she had a wine it. cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> probably like hit the like give me a, give me a second and she get the yeah. jack <laughs> and come back. Mm -hmm. So true. Mm -hmm. All right. Like so that. you have something called the Positivity Summit, and we are very intrigued on this situation. Will you tell us what how all happens there? Yeah. So the Positivity Summit, I was actually at a uh, a Tony Robbins event uh, in 2015, and one of my friends actually you know sponsored a ticket so i can go to it and i was sitting at the event and i was like this is cool you know like he's you know has a big presence and blah 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 and i was just like man but it's like the average ticket price was like thirty five hundred dollars or something crazy so i was like 
okay, there's only like the 1% of the population that can afford that, if that. I said, so there's a lot of people that aren't going to be privy to some of this information. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, like self-development's awesome. Like it's, it's great to get yourself better. So I'm like, I started writing down for like two hours. I wrote down this positivity summit and I said, okay, I want to do an event where it's just not me speaking. I want to do an event where I have men, women, black, white, Asian, you know, Muslim, Christian. I don't care. I want the day to be completely different and diverse. I want everybody to come up and share their story because within our stories, we'll see the commonality that threads us all together. And that's that we've all been through some type of adversity. So I was like, I want to have some diverse speakers. And I said, on top of that, I want people to interact in this workshop. And I don't want you to just know the person on your left side and your right side. I want to get people up and have them have mm -hmm. conversations. And I want to have group conversations. And how can we make change and have uncomfortable conversations? Like I want it, I want us to interact. We don't talk enough because we're afraid of what people like this person, I might offend this person, this yeah. person might get angry. So we don't have conversations. And then I said, okay, well, I'll make it two days. And on the second day, we're going to not just talk about doing something. We're going to actually go out and do it. So I was like, if I have all these people at my disposal, let's, let's do, let's act. So the first positivity summit we did in New Jersey, I loaded up two buses with like food, toiletries. And we went to this parish in Clifton, New Jersey, and we dropped off like 250 pounds of food. Yeah. And they were like, Oh my, you know, they're so excited, but I saw what it did to the people in attendance. Mm -hmm. Because when you give back, you give back exponentially, right? There's nothing greater than when you give. And everybody was just like so fired up that we were able to help people. And so we did the next one in New York. And I'm like, okay, this time we're going to just walk the streets. We're going to make sandwiches at this, the venue. We're going to walk the streets. We're going to give them out. Then I'm going to go to random coffee places. And I'm just going to put, you know, 30 bucks on the counter and say, pay for the next whatever coffee and just walk out. Mm -hmm. And we started doing that. And like people were going nuts like buying someone a coffee was so powerful there's one lady tried to chase me out of the coffee place just to thank me mm. for buying her a coffee right and i'm like man this is what it's about so we did one in la um in october and we went to this place called union rescue mission it's right you know right in skid row right in the middle of skid row and we walked everybody to Skid Row, and I did a speech uh, at Union Rescue Mission for the male population. And the and the women, they did the other, the women's nails, and they had conversations with them, and they talked to them, and mm. it was just such a beautiful thing. So I'm like, okay, I need to make this bigger because I don't have a team of people; it's just me. Yeah, like that's it. Like my wife does the website, and that's it, right? So just trying to figure out how to do all these different mm. things. Like the next one's going to be in to Toronto uh, in in April. And I, I just have a lot of speakers that are just great friends of mine that come and they share their story and they're not trying to like upsell you on anything. They just want to share with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's it's worked out. It's worked out great. So I want to do three a year all over the world. Like that's my goal. I love that. Um, hopefully you have one in Austin. Yeah. Um, I love the pay it forward too because um, it reminds me um, there was a lady having trouble with her parking meter uh, in downtown Austin. And so I just paid it for her. And she chased me and gave me this silk scarf. And it's funny because I just found it. I, th I could have swore it was like right by me. Um, I just found it today. I was like trying to get rid of a bunch of stuff. And I was yeah. like, and it was like, that was like two years ago. But I pulled out that silk scarf and it was just like a reminder of um, like that random encounter. But just also that um, people just aren't used to kind gestures anymore. Yeah. That it takes them by surprise. Yeah. You know, and that I wish that it was something that was so regular, not that it would go unappreciated, but just so regular that it's like, that's just how everybody treats each other. You know, that's so true. That's such a good story because think about it. I tell people all the time, when you give to someone, or you do something nice for someone, it's like a chain reaction. So when you're walking in a building and someone holds the door for you, what's the first thing that you do if you're a human? Hold the next, you hold yeah. the door for the next mm -hmm. person, right? And then you have this chain reaction of everybody holding the door. I've seen like... 15 people hold the door <laughs> for each other, right? Yeah. And the same thing can be op said the opposite way. Mm -hmm. If you're walking the door and the person just kind of close, lets the door close, you're not going to hold the door for the next person, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's uh, man, people think that it's like woo-woo or whatever, but like this energy thing is freaking real. Yeah. yeah. Like, this we're, is we're real. subconscious sheep for sure. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. being promotional models like Jade and I have spent a long, yeah. of, you know, long part of our career doing, when you're, 
trying to talk to people or interact with people or even pass out a pamphlet or whatever the thing is that you're trying to do to interact with humans, if you're watching big crowds walk by you, the first couple people that walk up, if they deny you, if they don't pay attention, they don't look up from their phone or they don't want to take it or they say no thank you or whatever the thing is, the whole – anyone who's witnessed that, even in their peripheral behind them, won't. So you have to wait for a gap and start fresh and hope this next one mm -hmm. you can yeah. – you know, get a better reaction from. And if they give you a good reaction, then everyone, even with free shit, you could be giving away yeah. free shit. And the person <laughs> says no, everyone behind them will say no. It's like, okay, yeah. but you guys are, are you actually looking at what I'm giving you? <laughs> yeah. We, we did a, in New York, we did a, uh, a high five challenge. So I was walking the streets and if you high five me, I gave you $5. Nice. And like people were like running away. <laughs> Like running, like That's what really is this? Funny. Yeah, like does this have, this guy got to chloroform me? Right, like they were running from it. Like yeah. high five, here's five bucks. They're like, yeah, no, no. What'd I'm you put good. on like, my hand? Yeah, you put, exactly. Like, you know, it's sad collection. though. Like, um, especially as women, like this man, I dropped twenty dollars, uh, leaving a pizza place a couple weeks ago. But Austin has become such a risky place, um, at night, you know, in certain spots, but, um pretty much the whole city really. And, um, this guy came up and tried to give it back to me and I didn't feel comfortable rolling my window down. And it wasn't because of how he looked. It wasn't the, he didn't seem aggressive. I just, I was in a dark parking lot by myself and I didn't feel safe rolling down the window. So yeah. it's, it's sad because you hear your story about the high five and it's sad, yeah. but it's like, you know, like, it's weird. It's a weird I don't know where I'm going it. with that, but yeah. it's just, it just makes me so sad. Like even as, um, Mercedes saying, uh, doing promotional modeling, um, it, it came to a point also like in the grocery store, um, you know, a lot of times making eye contact and smiling, people mm -hmm. can get the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. So you like beeline for your, you know, whatever item you're there for almond milk whatever and you beeline out because you don't know like yeah. you know how people are so it's just so so frustrating because i want to be this like person who brightens everybody's day at the grocery store and like <laughs> you know tells everybody something like to you know be a light but then it's like a lot of times when i'm out there by myself i feel so like um Honorable. Mm -hmm. yeah in a not safe way right. i don't know yeah. it's so it's it's kind of frustrating. But, it, but how crazy is that, right? That we can't smile at each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's I mean, really about, crazy. Like, how nuts is that? Well, the that, we is that sometimes then they follow you to your car because they yeah. think that you're you you're ready more. to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's sad because I want to live what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it's um, interesting because we just uh, earlier this week, I believe, end of last week, we had on um, someone we were discussing feminine masculine energies alpha omega paradox and this idea of femininity um being the energy that allows us needing to help make, mm -hmm. to make eye contact and to have a uh, more confrontational which seems adverse to what it is but yeah. um it allows us to have a more um that type of more confrontational and intimate i guess intimate's a better word intimate connection with humans that we don't know like even with strangers to make eye contact and that um, and Jade, I know you, you're, you have that feminine energy and you really do try to do that with people. And I've seen it go wrong, like in person. I've yeah. Well, and that. you saw how many stalkers I got. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and I'm it's, like it's... the type of person who right now I'm trying to embody my feminine energy because I have almost none. And so <laughs> I am consciously trying to make eye contact and like make, and do the things that we've discussed on the show of how to bring that up in yourself. And boy, I'll tell you, it's scary. It's yeah. literally scary because you have to be vulnerable. The only, the energy only comes through this vulnerability, really, you know, and it's, it needs to be mixed equally with the masculine so that you yeah. have this balance. You're not trying to be fully vulnerable and just let anybody, yeah. you know, hang out yeah. with you. But um, it is a strange time we're, we're living in. And maybe with, you know, the feminist movement and, and people focusing on that energy it'll change and, and maybe that'll change for, you know, all of us and your interactions too, Cornell, maybe yeah. they'll get easier. I'm hoping. Well, I, I feel well, and like... well that, that was my point. I hope that this becomes so regular mm -hmm. that the eye contact and the smiles aren't misread because that's just how we treat each other. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, yeah. I feel like with movements like the feminist movement and et cetera, I feel with movements, I think the one thing that we do, which kind of hurts movements is we make it exclusive. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So I was raised by a single mother. You know, respect women, love women. Uh, when you separate guys that are for the cause, it could be even more powerful because now got other guys in their peer, like see their peers, like bro, this is not how you talk to women. Mm-hmm. This is super disrespectful. Yeah, we need to raise you know, the bar. Mm-hmm. We gotta like, there's just things like whenever even movements like when you see like you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter, all, all these movements, right? Man, there are people that are for your cause that will ride with you that may not look like you, mm. but a hundred percent are for your cause. Mm-hmm. And if you separate them and generalize them with everybody else, mm. then what are we doing? Yeah. Right. Like oh, for pop- sure. And that's like, where a lot of the damage has come. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, too, when we, t- I mean, I don't know how deep we want to go into the feminist movement. I know that's <laughs> not the direction for this show, die, but wherever. Um, I think that. And the way we've expressed it before in the past, too, uh, because it's called feminist, you know, this movement, it's called the feminist movement, um, men are instantly turned off against it. You know, like, oh, well, that's not for me. Yeah. But mm-hmm. we all embody the female masculine energies like we uh, mm-hmm. they embody us. You know, we mm-hmm. couldn't have one without the other. It's the end of the other's yang. And we need to express both of them. Um because otherwise you end up really off kilter and it's mm-hmm. and it's no good for anybody, especially all the people you react, you, you interact with in your life. So, yeah, the feminist movement is not just it, the feminist movement is a movement for this planet. For it has equal nothing right. to do not for, with yeah. just women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this has yeah. to do. Yeah. I don't know. For me, it's, what you, well, what you're saying is such a great point. Right now, look, what are we told that feminists are like? What do like what we are told feminists right. are? And what we like, what they look like, and how they act, right? The the images that we're portrayed is not what you just said. It's the same oh, thing with like, not, yeah. like the I talk about the you know the Black Panther Party, and I was saying how John Lennon was like best friends with mm. one of the Black Panthers. Like people thought they were like anti-white. There are white people that supported the Black Panthers, Spanish, Latino, Asian. They're anti-tyranny. They're anti-government, right? Mm. So it's like we are the media portrays us in a certain light and people in a certain light and we start associating this with what the feminist movement is and this with what that movement is and you're right we don't like guys immediately think feminist i'm good like why would i it's a stereotype it's the same as any other stereotype you know we've decided we put a label what feminine we've defined feminism and as soon as you define something it's no longer evolving it's it's dead and i think the word Feminism is literally like if you could define what the female energy is, it's creation and evolution. So Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. say that it even has any sort of construct, you know, any sort of definite definition is Mm kind of like the antithesis of what the feminine energy embodies, what feminism should embody, which is this evolving, always changing conversation of how we can be more um, receiving and receptive to to everything that's going on around us. That's what oh. that's what the female does receives. Yeah, I love it. Um, I'm getting educated. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, on this uh, show, we try to find those little gray areas that people yeah. have decided are one way or the other Into way, and they have the an gray. opinion. Yeah, I love it. So we'll um, dive in. So we have a question from the Magic Mob. Russell on Instagram asks. In the midst of all the polarization in the news stream and online, do you have any tips for people to not focus on the negativity and combativeness that's been seemingly encouraged these days? This is really good for where we, you know, yeah. we're just yeah. headed. <laughs> Perfect. Well, first, Russell, thank you for your question. And second, I would say this. Uh, my mom used to tell me all the time, right before me and my brother would get in trouble for fighting, she would say it takes two to tango. Mm-hmm. So super important. The problem is we get baited into mm-hmm. arguing with ignorance. Mm-hmm. We get baited into it. So arguing arguing with ignorance is like me yelling at a wall. So if you guys are walking down the street and you see me just going in on this wall, <laughs> yeah. you'd be like, Cornell, what in the hell is wrong with you? Right? And you, it's this is a passage in the Bible as well. It's like, you know, don't argue with fools because people from a distance can't tell who's who. Mm. We get baited by trolls. We get ba- and I mean, everybody, the biggest celebrity or whoever ends up getting into some battle with someone that mm-hmm. is behind a keyboard saying, oh, you suck or mm-hmm. saying whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just our human nature to go after this ignorance. For me personally, 
I just don't get into it. Like right. Right. my block or delete or whatever, I don't care. Like I'll hit it quick mm-hmm. because I don't want to get into like uh, there's a coach called Don. And they're Lyon. not going to stop. Yeah. They're not going to stop. They keep going. And especially if they get a rise out of you. There's a coach, uh, legendary coach by the name of Don Meyer. And he goes, don't wrestle with pigs because mm-hmm. they like to get dirty. Right. They, that's this is where they live. Ignorant people live in this every single day. We don't live in this every single day. Mm-hmm. So why would you get into it with them online? Right. Like mm-hmm. me personally, I don't watch the, I don't turn the news on and have it play 24/7 in my house. Mm-hmm. Why? Because the news is going to show you what the news is going to show you. It's opinionated. Right? Mm-hmm. It depends on what channel that you're watching. So if I want to know what Mercedes and Jade is about, you know what? I will talk to Mercedes and Jade. Mm. Period. So mm. I just don't get I don't get baited into arguing with ignorant people because it's just going to what's going to do for me. I think that's the harder um, choice. Obviously, it's the choice that we are promoting, you know, here and even having this discussion. Um, and I think people don't take response. And I don't want to say people because I'm one of those people like I don't always take the responsibility of saying, hey, you're externalizing Mercedes. You're you're allowing this shit to come into your life. You're making the choice, you know, to watch that show or look at your comments on uh, <laughs> the gram or whatever it is. Um, when we have the choice, like the choice is always right there, no matter what it is, from moment to moment to moment, and we can just decide. Which sometimes it's and it usually is the harder choice to decide to um, move out of that mindset or that negative mm-hmm. drama or whatever it is that's sucking your energy out. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's the type of energy you can decide to live in. Some people even thrive off of it. These are the drama queens. You know, these are the people who yeah. thrive out of that drama. They make up the stories. They probably even, you know, might lie to make something sound worse than it is. Um, or you can decide to live in this other energy. I mean, it's all exists here on this planet. You have access mm-hmm. to all of it. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's for me, it's ego. Right. Like yep. back in the days when I would get into these like heated arguments over nonsense, it's ego. It's like because you're like, I don't want to be the person that walks away from this. I'm right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, so waste another couple hours in your life that you can never get back again. Mm-hmm. Would you rather I'm be right or would that. you rather be happy? Yes. Or, yes. Just tell him to kick rocks. Yeah. Keep... <laughs> E.G.O. of Deepak Chopra. I was listening to him earlier. He calls it edging God out. God out. Yep. So, yeah, mm. just like, you know, whatever you want to call God in your life, that energy yep. that is the the beautiful uh, infinite force that we mm-hmm. exist on. Mm-hmm. You can decide to allow that to thrive or not, guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that question, though. So uh, we have a pick your poison from Jesse on Instagram. Would you rather be famous when you're alive and forgotten when you die or unknown when you're alive and be famous after you die it's a weird question for me because honestly like fame to me is like whatever (laughs) but uh uh, i would say i'm all about legacy so if famous in the terms of people know what i've done like i made a Mm -hmm. positive impact for Mm -hmm. sure i don't care about people noticing me when i go to whole foods you know Mm -hmm. like that that's never interested me so yeah if people know i still talk about me when i'm gone a hundred percent of that because that means I at least made made a dent on this planet. Mm. Mm. I would go with famous while alive because I consider the word fame in the like feng shui bagua idea of it being being seen. So like if I can really be seen while I'm alive, I think I've made my incarnation. Like I think mm. that is being able to experience life to its to its one of its fullest points if that makes mm. sense yep um the fame of you know have a, like i'm literally a hermit crab like i i <laughs> don't leave my house unless i have to have to or i'm getting paid to usually for oh. work um which is terrible like i need to definitely be better about just socializing generally generally not through skype <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i think if i could find ways to interact with other humans on a regular basis and really f- allow them to be seen and and at the same time, you know, feel seen. I think that would make this existence on this planet that much better. I mean, I already get to do that with a, with a lot of the people that I do interact with, but yeah. Um, and this podcast is allowing yeah, us to sure. do that. By, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like quadruple, you know, it's yeah. exponentially allowing that for us so we'll see how that goes yeah i think i'd choose the same mercedes for similar reasons but also because 
um, while alive, um, my kids would be able to benefit from that. Mm. Um, we'd be able to, um, you know, have a bigger platform altogether and things like that. Um, and I would hope that even if I was forgotten, once I passed that my kids would carry on that legacy and how Mm -hmm. they lived and what they did with whatever that fame was, you know, because I would hope for it to be positive, but Mm. yeah. That's interesting though, because you're, you know, the man in this threesome here, um, that like we were talking about energies earlier, the male energy would ask for legacy over, um, mm, being, being seen, seen and a female yeah. energy is that's actually funny. specifically for being seen. Being yeah. seen. Yeah. Yep. So that is funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a few short questions we like to ask everyone who comes on the show. Mm-hmm. Sure. First off, what advice would you give your 25 year old self? Oh God. 25 year old self. Listen, mm. that would be the biggest advice I give my 25 year old mm. self listen i was when i was 25 years old i really i was super 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 headstrong so like masculine energy to the point where i just never let anything else in like i felt like okay i know it i can do it i can handle it blah 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 so i would say that'd be the main thing just listen and be open to other ideals be open to other things i mean this was also 25 year old cornell never traveled anywhere you know, only have been to like New Jersey and North Dakota. So I've never gotten a chance to it, had any type of experiences outside of that. So, yeah, listen. Cool. I love that. Um, so the next one is, if you could have the whole world read one book, which would it be? Oh, man. Are you a big reader? Yeah, I love to read. <laughs> you <laughs> wrote some books, I would assume, but you never yeah. know. Yeah. Um, you know what? This is an outside one. I would have the whole world read How to Be Interesting by Jessica Hagee. Mm. It's a small, like, little pocket book. Like, I know people are like, oh, The Alchemist or whatever. Like, yeah. that book is, it's such a cool book because it's a, there's, like, graphs and stuff like that. It's, like, an easy read. Okay. And I know if I told people to read that book, they'd actually read it because it's, like, 150 okay. pages. I like that. You know, so that was a, that's a pretty good book. It just talks about you being your unique self and being cool with that. Like, not everybody's going to accept you, but that's fine. Like, as long as you're true to you. Mm. I like that. Put that over the toilet, guys. Buy what? Buy yeah. <laughs> over the toilet. Swap in and out between Instagram and that, and listening to the Magic Hour. You know, of course, of course. Your business. Um, if you could whisper one phrase to everyone on the planet, Cornell, what would it be? One phrase. It would be. You are limitless. Mm, I love that right. one. So much potential. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, Cornell, before we let you go, where can people find you and your work? Uh, my website is www.cornell-thomas.com. On Instagram, I'm Cornell Thomas 34 Twitter, Cornell Thomas. Facebook, Cornell Thomas. And I always tell people if you have a question or concern, you can always email me at cornellthomas365 at gmail.com. Cool. And, and I'll that's... holler back at you right away. Like, I get back mm-hmm. to people right away. Yeah, you do. That's good to yeah. know, too. I think people really enjoy that type of interaction. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Oh, God, this is so fun. Thank you so much for taking the, the time best. and being with us. I got to bring the positivity summit to Austin. I'm gonna yeah. Be, I'm going to be in LA uh, at the end of January. You are? So I oh, gotta, great. Yeah. I got to figure out uh, how to bring the positivity summit back and have you guys speak at it and be a part of yeah. it. Like, I got to oh, work I gotta work all that stuff out. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Very yeah, cool. that'd be sure. really cool. I'm so yeah. honored. Thank you so much for having me on here. This was great. Yeah, we loved it. Um, You uh, seem to know already what you got to do with your sound now. Yes. With your audio. Okay, awesome. I'm going (laughs) to stop it and I'm going to send it to uh, Adam and we're good to go. Okay, good. Cool. So um, we want to air this as soon as possible, but right now we're doing a backlog of episodes because Mm -hmm. Mercedes is going to be out of the country February and March. So um, most likely this will air around February 20th. Sure. And we will send you um, like the promos that we're going to post, like whatever videos we're going to do, whatever, um, and um, all that the week of, just so you know. And um yeah, if you want to share them, you can, I will and uh, we'll be tagging you a ton. Land. So I will awesome. share them all over the land. <laughs> Thank, yes. you. Thank you, and Mercedes. You be safe. I will yeah. do. My, I'm going with Bellator, so I'll have lots of fighters okay. around me. You're um. fine. You're, you're fine. 
And Mo, seriously, I'm so so grateful that you guys had me on. This is awesome. You guys yeah, are the best. So much. Thank you for taking the time. No yeah. problem. I will talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Right, yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.